I'm Tim Ventura, and we're joined today by Dr. Peter Vincent Pry, the Executive Director of the Task Force on National and Homeland Security, a congressional advisory board dedicated to achieving protection of the United States from electromagnetic pulse, cyber attack, mass destruction terrorism, and other threats to civilian critical infrastructures on an accelerated basis. Dr. Pry is also the director of the United States Nuclear Strategy Forum, a congressional advisory board dedicated to developing policies to counter weapons of mass destruction. In 2015, Dr. Pry testified in Denver on Colorado's first attempt to pass EMP GMD legislation. Dr. Pry also continues to serve on the Congressional EMP Commission, like his fellow commissioners, despite the current lack of congressional funding. So, Peter, welcome. Let me start out by asking about your background. What led you into doing research into electromagnetic warfare in the 21st century? And what kinds of threats in the EM area were you focused on? Uh, the answer to that may be longer than you'd like. It goes back to my great grandfather, who uh, was a general in the Tsar's army and fought with the whites against the Bolsheviks during the Russian Revolution. Their side lost. Most of our family was killed and we refugeed here in 1921 to the United States. And ever since, there had been a strong strain of anti communism in my family. Um, uh, all my relatives and uncles fought in World War II. You know, we were very always concerned. It was drummed into our head that freedom isn't free, that the bad guys can come to these shores someday. And so uh, even when I was uh, growing up, you know, I had planned and hoped for a military career so that I could protect this country. Unfortunately, my eyesight, I was legally blind at the time. This was before LASIK was. So I, I, I wanted to see what kind of contribution could I make. And, uh, you know, I, I was reading everything I could find on military history. And, uh, you know, became a, a great student of classical military history, Hannibal, the Carthaginian Wars, you know, the wars all throughout history, Napoleonic Wars. And then one day when I was 13 years old, I read Herman Kahn's on thermonuclear war. And it kind of clicked. And I said, this is the decisive military technology of our era, you know, nuclear weapons and, and the Cold War, the struggle will be determined, you know, by who wins this technological struggle, you know, who can, uh, who can master the ability to fight or deter a, a nuclear war. And so I focused my attentions, you know, on learning about everything I could about nuclear weapons and, uh, and nuclear strategy and uh, started writing about it when I was, uh, when I was very young. And uh, my aim was to make myself employable by the CIA, you know, where your eyesight doesn't matter. And I did, I managed to get into the, you know, I scored among the top 1% of applicants, less than 1% of applicants and, uh, and got into the CIA. And uh, uh, before then I went to the University of Southern California and studied under the late great Bill Van Cleve, who was one of President Reagan's military and strategic advisors uh, in his defense and strategic studies department at the University of Southern California. And even while Van Cleve was teaching us graduate students, he was still advising the, the Reagan White House. And we would write position papers and things of that sort and got experience that way. And uh, I had heard about, I had read about EMP when I was a teenager. Almost nobody had heard about it. You'd have to be reading exotic books like Glass Stones, The Effects of Nuclear Weapons to know anything about EMP. But it occurred to me that even when I was a teenager, that an electromagnetic pulse could be the decisive phenomenon in a nuclear exchange between the powers, because it could en enable you to, to solve the problem, the early warning problem, you know, to black out the other guy's radars, to paralyze his command and control systems, so that you would have time to lay that first strike down on the ICBM silos and the bomber bases, and the missile submarine bases. And indeed, uh, you know, the, the, the Soviets were planning that. They had a secret that I found later. But when I went into the CIA, I was, uh, you know, their senior analyst for Soviet and the later Russian nuclear weapons and strategy. And uh, I was the first one to elucidate 
the fact of the important role that, uh, you know, it was just a small number of weapons, but they would play a decisive role in winning a nuclear World War III for the Soviet Union and the Russia by means of a EMP precursor attack. Uh, and uh, they had developed a secret weapon called the Fractional Orbital Bombardment System. It was a nuclear weapon disguised as a satellite, very high yield weapon that would be launched off a space launcher, not off of a military ICBM, and it would fly away from the United States in the opposite direction from North America, where our, all our ballistic missile early warning radars point north. And uh, it would fly over the Antarctica and come up at, at us from the south, where we're blind and defenseless. And we've never had ballistic missile early warning radars or, uh, or interceptors down there. And then when it's over the center of the United States, they could do that EMP that would uh, paralyze our command and control systems, and paralyze our forces, uh, you know, but, uh, you know, uh, so that is what got me, you know, the, the EMP phenomenology is what drew me into this new decisive way of warfare that has, that since the Cold War, it was started by the Soviet Union and can further developed by the Russians and has been adopted by all the bad guys, you know, China, North Korea, Iran, this concept of what I call a blackout warfare. They call it different things. They call it electromagnetic warfare or, or total cyber warfare or total information warfare. But it all amounts to the same thing. It amounts to a coordinated attack using EMP, cyber weapons, and physical sabotage, you know, to go after electric power grids and key command and control nodes and to attack the technological Achilles heel of a, of a society so that you can win the war without armies and navies or, or nuclear missile forces ever actually coming into confront, confrontation with each other. That would, uh, in, uh, uh, it's uh, considered by uh, uh, General Vladimir Slavchenko, who was the, uh, in his, uh, you know, in his, in his landmark book, uh, No Contact Warfare. Uh, describes this as the most revolution, the greatest revolution in military affairs in human history, because it can render obsolete all the traditional means of warfare, which are kinetic means of warfare that we think about, that you can actually win the war basically without having to fire a shot, without any navies coming in contact with each other and that sort of thing. And that view is shared by the proponents of this, of this theory of warfare in China and North Korea and Iran too. Uh, and uh, uh, I would add as an aside, Iran in 2010 pu published a, an official military textbook called Passive Defense, ironically called Passive Defense, but what it really is, is a pretty meticulous description of how to wage blackout warfare, specifically against the United States, including nuclear EMP attack. And, uh, well, while the nuclear Iran is not the topic of this interview, I've always thought that that fact uh, is something that I would hope would raise questions about the uh, estimate that has been prevalent in Washington for so long that Iran does not yet have the bomb. You know, they've been, they've, they've had, here, here's an official military doctrine, operational plan for blackout warfare that includes nuclear EMP attack you know, written back in 2010. Yeah. Well, now you recently published a report entitled China EMP Threat, and that was the one I wanted to focus on today. And so in that report, one of the things that you'd written was the foremost People's Liberation Army textbook on information warfare, Shen Wagong's World War, the Third World War, Total Information Warfare, explicitly calls upon China to be prepared to exploit HEMP offensively and to defend against it. So I'm wondering, could you tell me a little bit more about China's EMP specifically, what, what their strategy might be and how they plan to use that? Sure. Uh, for all of these powers, it would, it, you know, it would be the same, although there are, uh, there are variants depending upon the scenario. Uh, there's a lot of writing, uh, the, uh, the Chinese see EMP, nuclear EMP attack and non-nuclear EMP attack 
contract is an answer to our aircraft carriers, for example. You know, one of the problems you would have in a war with the United States is where are the aircraft carriers? How can you specifically locate them well enough to target them? Well, you don't have to worry about that with the EMP because the area of effect is so enormous, you know, that, that you could cover a whole aircraft carrier group quite easily, you know, with an EMP strike. And they write a lot about getting into the United States with a, uh, in a, in a war over Taiwan, which of course is one of their obsessions and using an EMP that would serve a dual use uh, to paralyze our, uh, our Navy, you know, that's trying to come to the uh, aid of Taiwan and to send a political signal, you know, because the, uh, they know the West is so fearful of nuclear weapons and that we have educated ourselves or brainwashed ourselves, however you want to put it, into thinking that nuclear war is unthinkable. You know, as soon as somebody uses a nuclear weapon, we've got to get, get an off ramp, we've got to avoid this. Uh, you know, that that would be a demonstration of their political will, a signal to us that, yeah, they're willing to escalate to the nuclear level. This interest is so great to them. That that alone, those two things in combination, the military benefit of paralyzing our forces and uh, sending a signal, clear signal to Washington and to the whole world, because it's not like the whole world is going to be quiet. You know, uh, you know the, the, uh, most of our allied governments are even more anti-nuclear than our own administration. Uh, you know, and we'd be calling for you know, peaceful negotiation. So that's the most common scenario where most of their writing is focused. They also talk about using a super EMP weapon to paralyze Taiwan itself, to take down its defenses, take down its power grid, so that they would be helpless to an invasion. You know, most of our calculations where the Pentagon says, well, they're not quite ready yet to invade Taiwan, don't take into account EMP. You know, that all of these uh, defenses, costly defenses that they bought are potentially vulnerable to an EMP attack. Uh, all the military bases depend upon the civilian power grid, just like ours do. The civilian power grid, well, the Taiwanese, I know, have tried to do things to harden their civilian power grid, unlike us. But there's also a scenario, you know, of a direct EMP attack by China against the United States itself, you know, as part of a uh, uh, you know, as, as part of a uh, effort to dominate the Pacific and then dominate the world, uh, you know, that, that isn't just sparked by a Taiwan scenario, but by China's broader ambitions, and that through design or miscalculation, we stumble into a, into a World War III with China, and, uh, and they know very well that the best way for them to win it you know, would be with a first strike, a high altitude EMP attack, you know, that would paralyze our forces and our, uh, uh, knock out our civilian power grid and begin the countdown toward the mass death of Americans. The EMP commission calculated that if we lost our national electric grid for a year, uh, you know, we could, we would lose up to 90% of our population through starvation, disease and societal collapse. That doesn't happen immediately. You know, it happens over time through starvation and, and, and societal chaos, uh, you know, but it would start happening within weeks or months of the, of the EMP event where things start falling apart. Imagine a Hurricane Katrina across the whole country, you know, and, uh, uh, and this would have their, their counting on this entering into the calculations of a rational American president. What do we do? Do we challenge China in a World War III the Asia Pacific, when we have, when as a consequence of the EMP attack, our military is, uh, is, is, is disorganized, is, uh, is uh, damaged in many ways. Uh, we're in effect trying to fight a World War III with both boots off and one hand tied behind our back, which we would surely lose. Or does the American president take what little is left that works? You know, most of the stuff that's gonna be left, around, uh, left over that works is gonna be in the military and try to restore our electric grid and other critical infrastructures on a crash emergency basis before we start having millions of Americans die off and have our civilization die off. Because we're not gonna continue to exist as a civilization when we have that kind of mass casual experience, we will simply become a zone of chaos. Yeah. What, we what, well, now, as I understand things though, Beijing's official policy, at least historically promises no first use of any type of nuclear weapons right and, and that would include 
the type that create EMPs. Can, can we rely on them to abide by this policy like the Russians have done for 70 years now? Of course not. Uh, you know, unfortunately, most of, most of academic and official Washington uh, takes them at their word. There are whole think tanks that are sort of dedicated to China, uh, meticulous reading of China's political open source statements. And uh, it's kind of been an article of faith in Washington for many, for many decades that there are no first use pledges sincere. Uh, it's only been a minority view that's been extremely skeptical of that. Uh, and there's always been reasons to be skeptical of it. Well, because you alluded to the Soviet Union promise or allegations of no first use, which turned out to be false. You know, we know in the aftermath of the, that they never, indeed, their planning was actually just the opposite of what their official declarative policy was uh, during the Soviet era. Now the Russians don't even make a secret of it and, uh, and, and plan for nuclear first use at extremely low levels of provocation, including just cyber attacks. Almost anything could justify their first use of nuclear weapons. And they're quite open about that as we are witnessing almost daily during the Ukraine war. Uh, well, what are some of the objective reasons to have been skeptical about China? Is it possible that the Chinese Communist Party, unlike, unlike the Russian Communist Party, is honest? Uh, you know, the political agenda behind, and I think the reason it's been so successful in brainwashing the West, uh, uh, you know, so that even today many people think, oh, China has a new first, first use pledge and they're going to stand by that. And by the way, uh, this is decreasingly so. I think today probably a majority of analysts say no, that no first use pledge is fiction and finally see the truth of it. Uh, you know, but for many decades, it was just taken seriously. First, that was because the focus of our attention was on the Soviet Union, not on China. Second, because China had been a Cold War ally and we weren't really interested in saying things that would disrupt that that uh, tacit alliance we had with China against the Soviet Union, but also because of the very powerful anti-nuclear movements in the United States, you know, which glommed on to the Chinese no first use pledge and started off, and, and China intended this to happen too. The no first use pledge was intended to undermine our ability to modernize and build up our nuclear forces and maintain our nuclear strength. And they would point to China as a good example of a, uh, you know, here's a, a superpower, a great power uh, that doesn't need a large nuclear arsenal, doesn't want one, and has even had a new a no first use pledge. Why can't we follow China's good example? And we should adopt a new first use pledge. We should build down our forces to a, a minimum deterrent like the Chinese have, which is another one of the kind of fictions that has been around in Washington for so long that China has a very small nuclear arsenal. Uh, uh, that has been increasingly controversial too. In, in recent years, about just how big is the Chinese nuclear arsenal? A guy named Phil Carver at Georgetown University, former senior defense official, you know, did a study, oh, I think it was in the 1990s, you know, that exposed the fact of the uh, Chinese have this the strategic rocket forces, not just China, but China's equivalent of the strategic rocket forces has the underground Great Wall comprising thousands of kilometers of underground tunnels. Uh, that could conceal thousands of missiles and, and many thousands of warheads. Uh, you know, another reason to be skeptical of the no first use pledge from a technological point of view is that it never made any sense militarily because, uh, you know, China's posture, its strategic posture. Uh, you know, it has no ballistic missile early warning systems, has no early warning radars. Uh, so it's new, it's, it, if it was not going to use its nuclear weapons in a first strike, it would lose them to a surprise attack. Uh, China, if it really had a small nuclear arsenal as the left and the panda huggers, the, the pro-China lobby has claimed all these years, if they really had just a very small nuclear arsenal and they really planned on no first use, then really the China's nuclear deterrent is useless, you know, because you could take it out with even using conventional forces 
And, uh, you know, in a surprise attack, you could do a nuclear Pearl Harbor or a non-nuclear Pearl Harbor and disarm them, you know, so they were not postured to implement uh, a credible no first use policy, you know, so why have nuclear weapons at all? Uh, and, and their posture is more consistent with somebody who plans to use nuclear weapons very early. If you've only got a small number of nuclear weapons and you don't, and you can't afford, and you don't have the ability to achieve tactical warning, then you're going to have to base your assessment of whether you're going to strike or not on strategic warning. You know, so for example, and we wouldn't know what that red line is. Is it the actual occurrence of a, of a war, you know, at some point where it's a, a big conventional war over Taiwan? And then they would surprise us, you know, by making a, a and they've been hoping that, that we would be believing this no first use pledge, you know, uh, and that we could be taken by surprise. And, uh, and their relatively small nuclear inventory would be able to achieve decisive results. You'd mentioned high altitude hemp strikes. I wanted to ask about uh, hemp attacks in space because you'd written that a hemp attack in space could enable, uh, basically it could be the most effective means of quickly neutralizing large numbers of LEO satellites that are crucial to US military operations. So I and you know I've heard in other places that actually space-based EMPs are much worse, I guess, than EMPs in the atmosphere or near the ground. But I was wondering if you could tell me what the risks are uh, in terms of space-based EMP attacks on satellites, and how do you think that would affect million civilian and military networks? Well, any nuclear hemp attack is going to be in outer space. And so you're getting a dual benefit of the powerful electromagnetic pulse that can fry systems on the ground and fly airplanes in flight and destroy electric grids and stuff, but at the same time uh, uh, serves as a very effective anti-satellite weapon. Uh, the EMP doesn't itself doesn't propagate through the vacuum of space, it propagates downward through the atmosphere. But what makes the EMP are gamma rays and uh, and there are also X-rays and neutron radiation that's put out uh, uh, all, you know, at a, uh, into, into, into outer space. And any satellite uh, 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 within line of sight of the detonation could be damaged or destroyed. And the uh, LEO satellites especially, but also MEO satellites, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, H, uh, high altitude satellites are probably far enough away to be okay. Uh, uh, and so, in effect, you could sweep the skies, you know, of your adversary satellites, which is, of course, critical to our military uh, capabilities. And so, you're getting a sort of a uh, to do, do a nuclear hemp attack gives you a, a bonus, you know, this bonus effect of, of also being able to, if you time it right, because you know where our satellites are, you know, and if you, if you time it right, not only can you get those aircraft carriers or get the continental United States, you know, you can also get key satellites that you want to take out. And this is a much more effective way of doing it. It's, there has been some talk about, I'm glad to see that the Department of Defense has been listening to the EMP commission on this, uh, you know, because there are some people in the Department of Defense who have realized that, but almost all of our focus is on, uh, on anti-satellite operations, is on Russian and Chinese like robot anti-satellites you know, uh, that are designed to go and approach a satellite and destroy it by kinetic means or put out a mechanical arm and take out that one satellite, you know. Uh, I almost wonder if that's a distraction, you know, so that, the, they don't, so that they'll keep us focused on things like that and not do the obvious thing, you know. Doing it by hemp attack is clearly a much more efficient way. I mean, you can destroy it most of these satellites at the speed of light and just get it all done and at the same time paralyze your, your adversary. But in recent years, there has been some sensitivity to that. I know in the Pentagon, uh, not as much attention, public attention has, has been paid to it as it deserves because people are so fi fix this, fascinated by the anti-satellite technology of killer satellites, uh, robot satellites and things like that. But if you think about it, what on, that's a much less efficient way of taking out satellites. You know, you'd have to send up a lot of these robots. Each one would have to maneuver its way, position opposite the satellite, and you'd have to not pay it, not notice that or pay attention to it. The kinetic operation would have to be successful. 
you don't have to worry about any of that with the habitat. Yeah, well, and you know, without going into details, right? You mentioned that the U.S. is probably more vulnerable to the to EMP than than perhaps other nations that were not as hardened, and. Uh, just based on my, I mean, my knowledge of technology, right? It's very difficult to harden against EMP. Now, you'd, you'd mentioned the electrical grid as a specific target. I mean, EMP would take out a whole host of electronics, right? So, so it, it would probably be impossible to harden the entire country. But do you think there are measures that we could take to improve our protection? Or, or do we have kind of a permanent vulnerability in this area? Well, I respectfully disagree. You know, I, I don't think it would be impossible to harden the entire country. Uh, and the, uh, it's not as difficult or it's expensive to harden against habitat as, as, as a lot of people imagine. Uh, you know, we've known for 60 years in the Department of Defense how to harden military systems and middle, military critical infrastructures using blocking devices and surge arresters and Faraday cages. Um, uh, if you're mass producing these things, uh, you know, what we should do is put our defense contractors, our experienced defense contractors who know how to do this in charge. I mean, there is a White House executive order that has directed all the US critical infrastructures be hardened against EMP. We shouldn't let the utilities do it because they don't know anything about it. They pretend they do, you know, but that's just because they they want to regulate themselves and they don't want outsiders coming in and getting involved. The, the hardest thing to overcome is not the technology, the money of the MP hardening, it's the politics of the MP, you know, because the electric utilities have so much clout. They've been successfully resisting, you know, efforts to get them to protect themselves. And as I said, I wouldn't trust them to protect themselves. I would, I would have, you know, if necessary, have the Defense Department pay for it, have them go in and harden those grids, you know. And uh, it may seem counterintuitive, okay? Uh, but let me give you an example. One of the reasons I think it would not be, uh, why well, it's certainly will that, well, within the realm of the possible for us to protect our whole society uh, is because we've already done it against one form of EMP called lightning. You know, in the EMP world, in the nuclear spectrum, this is called E2 EMP. And whenever we th th talk about the EMP threat, we almost never talk about the EMP, E2 EMP threat because it's equivalent to lightning. And uh, almost everything is protected against lightning. You know, we did this without an ex White House executive order. We did it without a lot of debate from Congress. You know, it was done largely voluntarily by everybody who manufactures electronic devices, you know, because you can't have, especially expensive electronic equipment, it's vulnerable to lightning. You just have to build it into the design. And, uh, and, and so, you know, even this personal computer that I'm talking to you on, it's got a little, it's got a fat plug that goes into the wall. Even your personal computer has got a little surge arrestor, which is designed to stop E2 EMP, the lightning effect. So that if there's a lightning strike on the power lines, you know, it won't get into your computer and destroy your computer. This was done without fanfare. Almost nobody noticed it. Uh, it's just that the whole industry recognized, well, you know, lightning happens all the time. We can't be selling people personal computers that are going to get fried by lightning strike. So we got to solve this. And the free market is amazing at being able to solve problems like this. So it doesn't add a lot to the cost of your personal computer. It's hardly noticeable. It's just a little, little surge arrestor about that big. But, but if you imagine all the power, the energy, and the lightning strike, you know, something that can blow up a tree, that little thing does the trick, you know, inexpensively. So, you know, why hasn't this happened for E1 EMP, which is basically the nuclear EMP, and the E3 EMP, which is the kind of EMP the sun generates in, in colossal solar storms that can also black out the grid and end our electronic civilization, because these things don't happen all the time. And industry never thought, saw it in its economic interests to take the long view and say, well, as long as we're protecting against E2 EMP, you know, how about developing surge arresters that will handle all three. I believe the market can do that. And it, and it, and it will, uh, if it became mandatory, if the National Institute for Standards, the White House, Congress said, you guys have to start protecting stuff, at least the cr most critical things. 
extra high voltage transformers, SCADAs that, that run critical infrastructures that are necessary to sustaining people's lives, start at least with the most critical things. And, uh, uh, and you must build the EMP hardness into the system. That's the thing that makes it least expensive. We also know from 50, 60 years of experience in the Department of Defense that if you design the EMP hardness into the system in the first place without retrofitting, uh, that it adds only in one to six percent to manufacturing costs, one mm. to six percent. So it's very affordable, very cheap to do, but you've got to do it. It's, it's best to do it that, uh, from the get go, and uh, uh, and just design it into the system. And I believe we could. This is one of the reasons I've dedicated my life, much of my professional life, to this, as has many of my colleagues, including the the free world's foremost EMP expert, Dr. William Graham, who had been my boss, the chairman of the EMP Commission. It's the only thing he, he will return, come out of fireman retirement to fight for again, is because this is an existential threat to which there's, for which there's no excuse for us to be vulnerable. We do have the ability to take this one off the table so our grandchildren won't, won't have to worry about it any more than they worry about lightning. And uh, uh, there's not many existential threats like that. You know, there's not many all out nuclear war, all out biological warfare, an asteroid hitting the earth. There's not many existential threats that you can, you can take off the table and do it cost effectively and cheaply and, and relatively quickly. This was one of them. Well, Peter, on that note, let me thank you again for your time and for your many years of service to our country. Um, so let me ask, what comes next for you and how do you see the situation with the China EMP threat specifically evolving in the near future? Well, to answer the, the second question first, you know, the world is, you know, I've spent my whole professional lifetime, you know, in the national security area, worrying about nuclear warfare, and cyber warfare and EMP warfare. And we've never been closer to the edge. I wouldn't be surprised tomorrow if we, if by accident or design, the United States got hit with an EMP attack by Russia over the Ukrainian war, or, or hit by China, because they've decided that this is the perfect time for them to go after Taiwan and establish a Pacific empire. The geostrategic situation is so reminiscent of the uh, late 1930s, early 1940s, uh, you, know, you know, when Hitler had swept through Europe and the Japanese empire, you know, was looking at, well, do we maintain peace with the United States or is this our time, you know, to strike out and, and dominate the Pacific and to realize our imperial ambitions? Uh, I think that it's even more dangerous than that because back in those days, the technologies of those days, you know, you could not win, fight and win a war, uh, you know, in, uh, in half an hour. And uh, you can today you know, by means of these technologies. Uh, and uh, if we're not ready, it'll be too late. So uh, I'm, I'm extremely uh, concerned that uh, either Russia or China or North Korea or Iran, you know, could you choose this moment to strike out. All of them might choose this moment to strike out because they all have uh, regional interests, ambitions. Uh, they know we can't do, fight more than one big theater war at a time. Uh, you know, there's no, just no way we would cope, especially if we're talking about them using weapons of mass destruction, making EMP and cyber attacks, you know, uh, to, to precede their, their, uh, their ambitions. What I had hoped to do, uh, you know, was uh, I've been uh, trying my EMP task force. I'm hoping we'll produce another book that spells out the vulnerability of our ability to project military power, conventional and nuclear military power on the civilian electric grid. And uh, I'm hoping that uh, Congress, somebody in the administration, people in the Department of Defense might finally get woken up to the fact that, that we cannot afford for our civilian electric grid to be vulnerable. You know, uh, uh, you know, not if we want to project military power. You'd think that that argument wouldn't have to be made. You'd think that people in the military and in Washington would say, well, our highest priority is to protect the lives of the American people, right? But that never seems to be 
the case in Washington. It's never, you know, uh, the interests of the people who always seem to come last. You know, as long as they can achieve their agenda, whatever it is in Washington. In the case of the Pentagon, it's you know, higher priority is the, to go off and fight uh, in Afghanistan or something like that. Uh, no, their highest priority should be to protect their power projection capabilities so that they can go off and fight in Afghanistan if necessary. And, and hopefully in the process of doing that, save the lives of millions of Americans. Wonderful. Peter, thank you again, sir. Thank you so much for having me.